Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us here at New America for this afternoon's debate on law enforcement versus smartphone encryption. Is the FBI going dark, or is it in a golden age of surveillance? Hashtag crypto debate for those of you on Twitter. Um, New America, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy enterprise that invests in new thinkers and new ideas to address the next generation of challenges facing the United States and the global community. I'm Kevin Bankston. I'm the policy director of New America's Open Technology. Uh, I should know my organization's name, shouldn't I? The uh, New America's Open Technology uh, Institute, the tech policy and tech development wing of New America, where we're dedicated to fostering a stronger and more open internet for stronger and more open communities. Uh, OTI is pleased to host today's event, which is focused on a technology policy controversy that's recently been in the news, but has its roots in the 1990s. Uh, that is the societal costs and benefits of widely deploying strong encryption technologies to secure our data and our communications. The most recent iteration of this debate was prompted by Apple and Google's announcements in mid-September that the data on new iPhones and Android phones would be encrypted by default so that only the users themselves can unlock their phones. On one hand, this announcement was quickly met by strong public complaints from law enforcement representatives arguing that the move would irresponsibly deprive them of critical evidence stored on those encrypted phones, even in cases where they have lawful search warrants authorizing them to obtain that evidence. The Attorney General and the FBI Director have gone so far as to suggest that Congress may need to step in and tell companies how to redesign their products to ensure that government investigators can access encrypted data or wiretap online communications whenever they have appropriate legal authority. Uh, otherwise, they warn that lawbreakers will effectively be able to go dark and evade detection or prosecution. On the other hand, technologists and privacy advocates argue that any attempt to create a surveillance backdoor for government uh, into these products and services will undermine the overall security of our data and devices while also putting U.S. companies at a serious disadvantage in the global technology marketplace. And they point to the fact that law enforcement and our intelligence agencies already have access to more data about us, uh, our communications, and our movements than at any other time in human history, a veritable golden age of surveillance, if you will. So which side is right? Um, well, we at OTI have our own perspective, and uh, uh, you can probably guess which way we fall on the question. But um, in response to a recent event on this issue here in D.C. that was built around a speech by FBI Director Comey, uh, we thought it important to pro provide a more balanced view uh, and allow policy experts on both sides an opportunity to fully air their arguments. Um, we've also posted, for your info, uh, to our blog a complete bibliography of all of the substantial writing that's happened on this issue since Apple's original announcement. So Director Comey said he wanted to begin a national conversation on this issue, so we're taking him at his word and doing our best to contribute to that conversation, uh, a conversation that might turn into a live legislative issue in the next Congress. Um, and we have really lucked out in terms of who we've been able to get to participate in that conversation. Uh, first, representing the law enforcement view, we have Andrew Weissman sitting in the center, uh, who is a senior fellow to both the Center for Law and Security and the Center on the Administration of Criminal Law at NYU Law School. Andrew was the FBI's uh, general counsel, uh, its top lawyer, until last year. And prior to that, amongst other things, he worked as a partner at the law firm of Jenner and Block and as special counsel to former FBI director Robert Mueller. Uh, with a wealth of experience in law enforcement and as a longtime advocate for the FBI on the issue of going dark, I expect he'll be quite the able opponent to privacy scholar Peter Swire, who will be representing the pro-crypto, pro-privacy view, uh, and is uniquely qualified to do so. Peter is currently the Wong Professor of Law and Ethics at the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business. Uh, after recently leaving his longtime perch as the C. William O'Neill Professor of Law at Ohio State, he's sometimes been referred to as, as one of the White House's tech policy czars. Um, he served under President Clinton as the Chief Counselor for Privacy at the OMB, served as Special Assistant to President Obama for Economic Policy, and most recently served uh, as one of the five experts on the presidentially appointed Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technology that issued a comprehensive report and recommendations on the NSA's surveillance programs, including recommendations regarding encryption policy that I'm sure will inform his perspective here. Uh, as will I expect his paper, Going Dark versus a Golden Age of Surveillance, which served as an inspiration uh, for the title of today's event. And finally, our moderator for the afternoon with a unique perspective that finally balances both the civil liberties and law enforcement perspectives uh, is Nancy Libin. 
Uh, Nancy served over three years as the Chief Privacy and Civil Liberties Officer of the US DOJ, Department of Justice, before settling into her current position as a partner at the law firm of Wilkinson, Barker, and Nauer. Before going to the DOJ, uh, Nancy served as counsel to Senator Joe Biden. Uh, after cutting her teeth as a young digital rights lawyer at the Center for Democracy and Technology, Small World, the same nonprofit that I worked at before joining o OTI last year, and where Peter is currently a policy fellow. So we have an absolutely incredible group of law and policy experts here uh, to discuss this issue today. Uh, what we don't have on stage today, admittedly, is uh, our technologists, um, which is why we're hoping to find a good pair of technical experts to also debate this issue in the near future. In the meantime, though, I'm going to hand things over to Nancy to kick things off, starting with opening statements of less than five minutes from Andrew and then Peter, then questions from Nancy directed at both or either of them until around the turn of the hour, and then we'll open things up for questions from the audience. Thank you again for coming. Enjoy the debate. And again, if you're tweeting, the hashtag is crypto debate. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for hosting today. Um, so we're going we're gonna to start with opening statements. Um, and I think we'll start with Andrew. Great, thank you. Well, thanks to um, the New America Foundation. Um, I hope this is informative for all of you. Um, so I tend to like to think, um, in spite of the fact that I am a litigator, this is a discussion more than a debate, because I think that there's a lot of heat and not necessarily a lot of light that's brought into um, this topic. So let me start by um, talking about something that may be basic to many of you, but I'll make sure everyone's on the same page. And that is, I'll deal with a little bit about the facts, deal with the current law, and what I see as the issue that confronts not just law enforcement and the intelligence community, but all of us. So I assume that, like me, I brought a prop with me, which is all of you have something that looks a lot like this. Um, and if we do our job correctly, um, you will not be using it during this discussion slash debate, but I suspect that we will fail in that, and that many of you will be checking your emails and even sending emails um, during all of this. Um, yes, or, well, perfect. It's like a, you're a plant for my, exactly <laughs> my point. You'll be doing emails, messaging, instant chatting. Um, you know, the one thing you won't be doing, ideally, is actually placing phone calls and talking to somebody. Um, and the reason I raise that is that the world we live in um, is really different than the world we were in in 1994. Um, the ability to communicate in myriad ways has just changed completely um, from the time that I was a kid. It reminds me of, I have a nephew who when I talked to him about typewriters said to me, what is a typewriter? So things have really changed. In 1994, when Congress passed CALEA, um, it covered what at the time was a basic way of communicating. People either communicated in person, by letters, or by phone calls. And by Congress requiring that in, when you make a phone call, there needs to be a way that if the government got a court order based on probable cause and met sufficient standard, um, that there would be a way to effectuate an intercept um, of that telephone call. The problem is the world we live in is different than in 1994. So when you email, when you message, um, that is no longer covered, it's not no longer, it is not covered by that 1994 statute. So the ways in which we all communicate, including criminals is not something that law enforcement can have access to by law. So that's the problem. The thing that's not at issue here is um, this is not a question of can law enforcement just unilaterally get something. When the law says that it is not required to have an intercept ability to go into emails, that means that even if the government met the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt and convinced an independent court, an Article III court, that an order should be issued allowing an interception, that it still would not be possible to do that intercept. 
So the issue is not about sort of what is it that what is the showing that law enforcement can make to allow the government to actually do an interception, because under when you have something not covered by CALEA, it means that even if there was proof beyond a reasonable doubt, you're not going to be able to get it um, absent a company voluntarily deciding that you can do it, um, but it wouldn't be legally required. All of this came to fruition, uh, as Kevin noted, when um, Apple announced um, that it was going to, as a default, have um, its iPhone uh, encrypt uh, its communications capabilities. Now, frankly, there was nothing new about that. The issue of going dark has been one that law enforcement in the United States and overseas has been focused on. Um, the thing that was somewhat novel about the, um, the way in which uh, Apple said it was that it announced this at, not as an ability to have a more secure system, but rather this was going to make it impossible to comply with court orders. So normally that is not a, the outright goal, that is sort of an unfortunate byproduct of trying to make something more secure. So the debate, the, the issue for all of us is that there is no perfect world. There's nothing where you can have both a completely secure system where you can be hack free and you can have the most um, bulletproof system in the world and yet also have a system where um, a court can make sure that its orders can be effectuated. There's going to be trade-offs. There's going to be a balancing. Um, in order to make th that normative assessment about what it is that should happen, when, if ever, should the government be allowed to um, effectuate an intercept of a, an email or a telephone call. Um, there are a lot of sort of factual questions, many of which are unanswered. Um, and I think one of the reasons that Director Comey called for this conversation and called for um, Congress also to look into this is because there needs to be, I think, more data. Law enforcement, I think, and the intelligence community has to do a good job and certainly I think a better job of articulating um, the costs that it is experiencing in terms of preventing criminal acts, preventing um, criminal acts that, that are um, sort of more routine law enforcement type issues from criminal acts that are, are um, really intelligence community issues, meaning terrorism. Um, by the same token, I think that the um, internet service providers have to do a better job at talking about what exactly is the cost to them um, in terms of if you create a system where you can have an intercept cap capability, what are the best ways to minimize the damage? Um, in other words, what are the risks that you face from that? Um, what are the economic costs? What are the abilities to prevent hacking, um, and for to prevent illegal intrusions? But at the end of the day, there will have to be a normative decision. Um, where I come at, at this, and it is certainly informed by the fact that I worked in the government, and I worked at the FBI, and I it was part of seeing daily threat streams, both criminal matters and national security matters, is that in that trade-off, um, i rather have a system where, a, with a court order, you can help minimize the risk of serious criminal acts, including terrorism, as opposed to the, also the downside of having a system that will be more subject to intrusions and hacking. Um, but that is, that is going to be a judgment call for all of us and for Congress to make. But I think that that normative decision requires a much greater vetting of the factual issues on both sides uh, in terms of what the costs are. Thank you, Andrew. Peter, do you want to? Yeah, thanks. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks to Kevin and uh, OTI and New America for hosting, and it's a delight to be here. I'm going to highlight in these opening remarks two themes. One is why we want to have good cybersecurity, and the second is this debate between going dark and the golden age of surveillance. Um, very fundamentally, uh, there's a device manufacturer, now two, that proposed a new feature that makes the device more secure. 
and we can imagine a government regulation coming in and saying you can't do that, that's a really strange and surprising thing to tell to device manufacturers. Um, all of us have been around the cybersecurity debates where this is an existential threat to the United States. This is one of the, the biggest threats facing us, uh, cybersecurity, executive orders, and legislation. And in the course of our discussion, I think we'll get into more of the technical things. But for now, the basic story is strong cybersecurity that everybody knows you're supposed to use encryption for a lot of things. And that's what Apple and Google are adding in this particular way at this time. So I think that this is a security argument for what Apple and Google have done. The, the second point is in these debates about law enforcement, national security, privacy, civil liberties. We go through phases, we go through periods. We're not, 9-11 was a while ago, Snowden's recent, there'll be some other bad time when bad things happen. Um, as a society, we have to make some basic judgment. Are we going dark? Are our forces of law enforcement and national security too weak? Or have we given really quite substantial powers and benefits and advantages in a period right now? And I'm going to say it's the second. So the going dark term, uh, previous FBI general counsel, uh, Valerie, what's her last name, Caproni? Caproni. Um, was, I think, the first person to testify, at least, saying going dark. The instinct from the FBI side was, this technology is changing. CALEA doesn't apply to software and hardware. And encryption is going to mean that we go blind. We come in, we get a wiretap, and all we get is ones and zeros. We don't see anything. That's the going dark instinct. Um, I've written a paper a few years ago, before Snowden, about why instead we're in a golden age of surveillance. And I'll give you three reasons for that. The first reason is that, as Andrew said, we are now in a world of the most uh, pre prevalent tracking devices in human history. All of us carry tracking devices almost all the time. Criminals do because they have to talk to their fellow people to do it. In human history, there was never GPS on bad guys and good guys alike. So an enormous change in the ability to track people. Second thing, if you're law enforcement, a lot of times you don't care what I say. You want to know who I say it to. Who are my co-conspirators? Who are the other possible leads that will lead you in the investigation to these things? That's what's called metadata. We are in a fabulous period for metadata. How many texts do you write? How many emails do you do? How many social network posts? How many I'm checking in from here do you do? The explosion of metadata means that law enforcement has an unparalleled period where they can link me to my confederates. Huge advantage for law enforcement. Third, all the other databases. Um, somebody uh, was talking to me as I was getting ready for this about Uber and Lyft. You know what Uber does? Uber takes a cash transaction for a taxi and turns it into an identified credit card followed where I went transaction on Uber. That's happening throughout our society as all these different databases happen. One of the biggest ones is what's called the data broker industry uh, that the FTC has done a report about. Law enforcement is able to subscribe to amazing databases in a huge range of things. So when we add up the ability to spot people, and then we add it to the people to find all my confederates, and add it to the fact that there's multiple subsidiary databases everywhere, that's a period of surveillance that is absolutely better for the FBI and others than the pre-internet world was. So instead of saying we have lost something, the golden age of surveillance argument is that the uh, surveillance people have tools they've never had before. And I think after Snowden and all the press stories we've seen, the idea of going dark as the description for the surveillance capabilities just doesn't match what we all have seen. And I thought these arguments were clear before the Snowden revelation. So I think we are in a golden age of surveillance. Our need to write new rules to help surveillance is not where I think Congress should go. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm going to start with an opening question for Andrew. Um, and Andrew, you mentioned at the beginning of your uh, presentation that uh, CALEA, I think you mentioned CALEA, which yep. is the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, uh, which was passed in 1994, um, put some limitation on providers' obligations with respect to encryption. Um, and under CALEA, uh, providers are obliged to turn over uh, plain text to law enforcement when law enforcement comes with a warrant or whatever legal process is required. Um, providers are required to turn over plain text if, number one, they have provided the encryption, and number two, they have the ability to decrypt the data. Um, 
And that's where the law stands right now, uh, which is why Apple and Google uh, will no longer fall in that category because of the new policy. Um, so we also, uh, as you were at the FBI when the conversation about uh, updating CALEA, CALEA 2 was taking place. The FBI and DOJ are in the process or have been in the process of an interagency uh, discussion and, and um, looking at new legislation. Several years ago, your predecessor um, uh, publicly stated that, Valerie Caproni publicly stated that encryption was not on the table, that, that the FBI could live with the bad guys using encryption uh, even when that would preclude FBI access in some cases, that the FBI did not want to relitigate the crypto wars of the 1990s, but there were other concerns and they could deal, the FBI would, would uh, address other concerns it had with CLIA. So my question, it's a long question, That's right. um, is what's changed since that? How does the Apple-Google announcement change that calculation that the FBI had made? Sure. Um, so, the so I think that's not exactly what Valerie was on this in terms of the going dark problem because the going dark problem is really um, the same except factually we're sort of in a worse position um, because the more that there are communications that fall outside of Calia, the more that there is a problem that you can get a court order and it's it's not worth the paper it's printed on because if you show up with that piece of paper. Um, it's not going to be effectuated, no matter what showing you've made to the court. Um, so her concern was um, that you'd not impose an obligation on a company that had no power um, to um, deal with the encryption issue. As opposed, in other words, if they didn't either provide the, um, the key or the encryption, but if they kept the key, um, if they had, um, or if they had created a system where they deliberately um, made it so that you didn't have a key, that wasn't something that the FBI was saying, oh, that's great. Um, that's always been something that's problematic um, for the FBI. It's been, certainly, I don't mean to drill down this, but it certainly has been problematic. I'm wondering, though, why, it, because she was very clear publicly at the time that they were not that the FBI was not interested in changing the obligation of the provider to break encryption. But you have to remember the issue was when CALEA happened, this is, this is the state of CALEA. So you're dealing with telephone companies where the issue was simply that's the way in which Americans communicated other than in person and you put clips on it. The issue was what to do with all the new written forms of communication, to put it bluntly, so that are happening sort of in real time. So let's say you have email traffic or messaging. If it's encrypted and the company had, and it was done entirely by the consumer, and the company didn't do, and didn't have any responsibility for it, there everyone said, look, that you have to deal with that issue um, on a sort of individual basis. And I think those were exact words. We understand that there have to be individual solutions. Right. But the issue of a company um, dealing with just, we're just not going to create a system, is something that she battled and I battled as well with dealing with that um, where the law d doesn't require companies to do anything different than what Apple's doing, but trying to get companies to understand right. what the risks are. So I, d I just don't think that's a sort of correct reading of it. The way in which Kalia, to me, the debate is in some ways about the FCC, because when Kalia was passed, the um, people who passed it were trying, in fact, to make it evergreen. Um, they understood that technology changes, and the method for that was that to the extent that there were going to be new means of communication that were going to functionally be the same as telephone calls, that the FCC is supposed to update the um, way in which CALEA works to encompass those. Um, so I think the biggest change, which was an expansion of CALEA, was for voice over internet uh, protocols. Um, but to me, this is a perfect example of, in some ways, this debate has already been had, which was that CALEA was supposed to be expanded by an agency, so it was supposed to be a more streamlined process, 
than Congress to include things like email. I think all of us would say email now is the functional equivalent. But you don't have the FCC acting. So either the FCC or Congress, I think, needs to step in to essentially put us in the same place that we were in um, in 1994. Okay, I just, uh, yeah. I think, and Peter I'm a little itching, having, having lived through the 90s. Um, CALEA, as passed, was a, first of all, it's the, it's the law that said that telephone companies had to make their uh, systems wiretap ready. So if a court order showed up, the phone company wiretap would work. That's the basic story for CALEA. Um, and at the time, there was a big fight in Congress. And there was a deal in Congress that said the internet was going to be excluded, that IP protocol, software, hardware for the internet was going to be excluded. And that's been the law ever since. And they didn't have the decision to move forward in Congress until that carve out happened. 1994 was not prehistory. The internet was out there. Email was out there. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act was 1986. And the Congress decided not to include it. And to expand it to people doing new hardware, new software, to go through the absolutely crippling complexity of the Kalia litigation that we saw in the DC Circuit after the first law would slow up innovation, would put regulation deep into an awful lot of things. So I think in a, a big expansion of Kalia way beyond what the 94 deal was is a dramatic departure from the status quo. L let me just for a second come try to say um, something about the going dark really crisply. Um, imagine, if you will, that there's a situation where you have access to 50 new databases you never had before. And one or two of the things you used to do sometimes you can't do anymore. That's the way that I look at the facts around this. And the one or two things, there's a paper in the, inter uh, an article in The Intercept that said that three of the four examples that Director Comey used to justify this didn't stand up to scrutiny, would not have helped in the investigation in a material way. And so with all of the knowledge of the FBI about investigations, and they don't have cases to show that match the concern, that's a really crippling factual problem in a time when there's so clearly so many access to databases they didn't have back in the 1990s. Okay, thanks. So can I respond to that? Sure. <laughs> so that might make it sort of, um, so I think this is a really, I think this is a legitimate um, point to raise, which is the issue of when you're comparing sort of where we were to 1994, because that's sort of a benchmark. Um, and you're sort of asking, well, what is, law, is law enforcement in a worse position or a better position in terms of and it's, what are the costs from a law enforcement perspective? That is a totally legitimate question. Um, but it's, as I said, the same token, you could raise the same issue with respect to technology. What would be the cost of having an expansion of, of some form of CALEA? So the way I look at that is, I think that it, it, there is no question that the issue of GPS devices, of uh, being able to track location, um, understandably with, with court um, uh, process where you have to meet a certain level. Are you willing to have probable um, cause warrants for that? Well, right now under Jones, um, I think that's what the FBI is yeah, doing. If they touch so, the... Um, no, no, no. That's what the FBI is doing okay. if they, there isn't trespass. Um, so, but the... To me, there's no question that GPS is something that law enforcement and intelligence community has now in a way that is broader than it had in 1994. You certainly could make the argument that in 1994 you could figure that out using telephone calls. I mean, you can obviously telephone calls, you can get a lot of data from that, um, who's calling who. Um, it can help you in terms of where they are. Um, but it's not in any way comparable to looking at GPS. Um, so that is definitely something that, is m that you have that's more. But if you asked somebody in law enforcement and the intelligence community, um, which I think actually Peter does in, in um, one of his articles, sort of which would you prefer if you had a system where every single email um, and chat was beyond, you could not look at it. It was one gigantic tour and you did not have the ability to get content. Um, what you did have was GPS. Um, I think that you would say, of course I want content. That is a huge, huge loss um, that in 1994, you could get the content of the communication on a telephone. You cannot get that now. I used to be an organized crime prosecutor. 
there's one thing to see mobsters doing walk talks and know who they're meeting with. And um, law enforcement would look and see who was at weddings and who was at funerals and who walked around the block. But until you actually knew what people were saying, you could not make a case. Um, you couldn't make a criminal case. If you were dealing with terrorism, you would have no idea what they were plotting. Um, yes, it is data um, that you have when you can see who people are associating with. But the con there's just no question that the content of communications is going to be extremely valuable from both an intelligence perspective and from a law enforcement perspective. So if you imagine the world of um, where we were in 1994 when you have telephone calls that are able to be intercepted and you imagine a world where um, all communications of emails and chat were end-to-end -end encrypted and were uh, were as if it was on the tour, um, I think we'd be far worse off. And I, I, it's hard to imagine that, that anyone in, in law enforcement and intelligence community wouldn't say the same thing. So I want to pick up on that, um, and this is for Peter. Um, and I want to draw on something that Chief Justice Roberts said in the recent Riley case. So Riley was a Supreme Court case this year, earlier this year that reviewed the limits of uh, law enforcement searches incident to arrest. And the court held that law enforcement uh, had to generally has to get a warrant before searching the contents of a phone, smartphone, that it recovers from somebody, an arrestee. Um, and in that case, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts uh, said and made a very bold statement. He said, privacy comes at a cost. And he recognized the impact that the decision would have on law enforcement, but said, nonetheless, the data that's on our phones today is so qualitatively and quantitatively different, so uniquely personal and sensitive, that uh, law enforcement must, under the Fourth Amendment, get a warrant uh, before it can access the contents. However, and this is, I'll pose this to Peter, uh, Chief Justice Roberts also went on to make clear that their holding did not make the information immune from search. So my question for you is, is Apple's and Google's policy doing just that? Well, well first of all, I think the, the Riley decision was a super important decision to, for the court to recognize how sensitive the material is on our phones. Um, we have chief justices and justices who've now lived with a life of cell phones, and they realize that getting into that and taking all of that just because I got arrested for going five miles too fast, that's the wrong decision. So it's a huge win. But I think the privacy at a cost miss, misses, I think, the stronger argument for that we're costing security if we break these defenses. And I'm just, I haven't gone through the technical stuff much, but let me just make a few of the points. Some of these are from the IEEE USA has done a, a study that just really goes through for technical experts why it's hard to build back doors that will not turn out to be major points of vulnerability. Among other things, when you try to build the back doors, it gets much more complex to write the software. Complex software is more easily broken software. Um, another problem with the back doors is that becomes the focus of attack for the next time. And we have examples of that, such as Google had a database of all the people under PRISM that it was keeping track of in the email. And the Chinese hackers went in and got the database of who the terrorist suspects are. It's a honeypot, it's a target, it's the thing that you go for once there's a backdoor system, that backdoor system becomes the focus of attack. Um, there's a book by Susan Landau about surveillance versus security, where she talks about what happened with Vodafone in Greece. Their lawful intercept mechanism for the phone system got compromised, like Google's database did. And the prime minister and other major people in Greece were subject to massive wiretaps because the system that was supposed to be used for law enforcement access became the system for compromise on a very large scale. Uh, there was an example in Italy as well. So when you say privacy versus security, then the sort of tough view is, well, we want security. The point here, and the point made by pretty much every technologist who's written about this, is that it's surveillance versus security, and security is being compromised by what Director Comey was asking for. Well, can I just say, I, mean, I think that it is right for technologists to focus on the issue of what would the cost be 
in terms of cybersecurity if there was going to be a um, intercept solution that was required by law. I mean, that's something that you, in order to decide the normative issue of where, do you, where should the line be, it is totally appropriate to ask that question. But it's, I, I think the, what I've seen in the debate is that you, people say, well, just focus on, wait a second, if you require um, the ISP to have an intercept solution, that will come make it, the system more vulnerable. Let's take that as a given. Um, let's assume that everybody would agree to that. I'm just going to assume that um, for the purposes of argument. The issue is still a question of, um, one, how much so? What are the best possible systems that you have to minimize that risk? And then is it worth it? In other words, what are the other downsides? I mean, you, that's just part of the issue. There are lots and lots of interests here. There are civil liberties issues, there are cybersecurity issues, there are law enforcement issues, and there are national security issues. So it seems to be all of those players need to present what the harm is and also what is the best way to minimize that harm depending on, so that you can decide what is the correct line. My biggest issue here is that that sort of fleshing out of and really forcing everyone to come up with their best arguments and the best um, ways in which they could mitigate the risks really is a job that Congress is supposed to be doing. I mean, it's obviously this is a town where it's easy to blame Congress, um, but that is something that I just as a citizen think is needed. Um, that that is something where you want somebody to make that decision consciously, not just we're in a default system now and if nothing changes, we've sort of made the decision without actually really looking at the data and looking at it intelligently. Okay. So, I, I know you have quite, but so um, I think Andrew makes the point that we want to know what the facts really are and what Congress is the appropriate place to do a lot of those fact finding. Um, but I'll make three quick points. One is we had really long detailed arguments about the facts of encryption in the 1990s. Um, I lived through a lot of those meetings. I was the chair of the White House Working Group on Encryption in 1999 when the policy changed. And so, the, you know, and people who care about national security and law enforcement were in the rooms then and we worked through facts over a period of years. Second point is there's an astonishing um, uh, uh, imbalance in discussion on the technology. All of the technologists who are on that bibliography who have written are on the side of you must be nuts to have back doors. No technologist has come forward from the government or somewhere else and made the point about no, it's really not that bad. And then the third point about having the back door is we talk as though it's going to be only the FBI with really good Article III judges that are playing here. But these devices are going to be used in China, in Pakistan, in Russia, in whatever your least trusted country is around the world. If the U.S. creates a system of back doors, those back doors will be insisted upon in these other countries. And they don't have the same Article III judges. And it will be used for a lot of other purposes. And it means if there's a way to grab your phone when somebody's visiting in that country, then that government will have a way in. So we're protecting cybersecurity in a global way. And these facts have been debated before. My article on encryption and globalization, I commend to you. It's 80 pages long. It'll put you to sleep. But, um, but these, these arguments have gone before. And when this happened, the technologists have ended up on one side of the argument. So I just wanna, I wanna pick up a little bit on what I was talking about before with the, in the Riley case, how Chief Justice Roberts uh, made very clear that the decision would not preclude the FBI from getting the information it needed. Um, and so I wanna talk about whether Apple's and Google's policy does that. Aren't there other ways in which law enforcement could get access to the contents of a cell phone other than so, going to Apple and Google? So I think that's a really good um, question. So I think that there are um, at least two ways that you can think of as being potential ways for the government to get that information. In other words, what is the alternative source, even if you had sort of pure end-to-end -end encryption? So um, one potential way is if the user backs up to a server 
where you can actually then serve process with whatever legal showing that needs to be made. Um, is that a way that solves this issue? Um, meaning that, well, Apple might say, don't worry, we can't provide, legally provide this. In fact, if it owns the server, they can. Um, or if somebody else has the server, they can, the other party can Let's do call it. that iCloud just as a high um, yeah. And the other way is if you could go to the actual user um, who um, has the end-to-end -end encryption and say, what's your password? Um, it, that would be another way. These are all ways to say, you know what, maybe it's not as, as secure as, as Apple is sort of suggesting. So here I, s I see there's sort of two problems. So first let's take what I call the Fifth Amendment issue. Um, so the issue of going to the end user is, um, so um, you know, we're in America, so let me just focus on the American system. One, you have to find the person. Um, so that may be a lot easier said than done. Um, I mean, you might know um, what account you want, but you don't know the actual name and location of the person, and the person may not be in the United States, um, so that they may not be subject to process. So um, you can't just sort of say, tell me your, your, if they're in, you know, name your foreign country, you can't just go to them and say, tell me. You'd have to actually serve a grand jury subpoena or some other type of process. So those are huge issues already. You have to find the person. They have to be within the reach of United States jurisdiction. And then you have the issue of the Fifth Amendment. Now, that is a, I could bore you because there's law on both sides of that. Um, there is some messy language in the Hubble decision from the Supreme Court. Um, this is a funny issue because you find law enforcement saying, yes, there's a Fifth Amendment, and you find non-law enforcement people saying, no, there isn't, which is sort of a reverse of what you might expect. So in putting on my role as I am now an academic, in theory, it is very, very hard for me to understand why there isn't a Fifth Amendment. Um, this seems to be a classic act of production. You are producing something, namely your password, and the court has traditionally protected that act of production and, and derivative use um, if it couldn't somehow incriminate you. To me, that seems clear. But admittedly, there are um, there is law on both sides. And as I said, there's language in the Supreme Court case that would suggest you, you may be able to get it. At the very least, there's going to be a lot of litigation about that issue. So that falls into the category of that is not really a workable solution, I would say, for the main reason that you don't you can't find the person or know that they're here but I also don't think that the Fifth Amendment issue is in any way clear the second issue is the backing up issue so look if you're fortunate enough to have um, uh, you know one we're talking about conversations that you want to get that are criminal because you've shown the necessary probable cause so we're not concerned about innocent people um, who are backing up. So you know, I back up because you know, I don't want to lose all my data. That's not exactly, at least as far as I know, that's not something that the intelligence community or the FBI is particularly interested in. What they're interested in is criminals who are doing this. So I think for some unsophisticated criminals who are backing up, yes, that is a potential way um, to get information. That is one way to solve this issue. But if you're talking about terrorists or you know, people who are in any way sophisticated, you know, if you're, you're not in the business because you want to get caught. The whole point is to do something so you don't get caught. So the idea that you would be a terrorist who backs up to the cloud seems really unlikely as a potential solution to say, well, don't worry. You can, uh, this is fully encrypted, but you can get it from iCloud. Um, so I don't think that's going to be a real solution for law enforcement or the intelligence community. So a couple of things that have, we haven't said so far. One is I think what Andrew just said makes clear this is not just about Apple and Google this fall. This is really a discussion more broadly about encryption and, is, and should the companies put it in in a lot of places. Uh, because when we arrest the person and their phone, we know where the person is typically. Most of the time when you get my phone, you know where I am or you know it's my phone. So, he's going, so it's broader than that. Second thing that hasn't come up enough in the debate is that a lot of law enforcement searches are towards enterprises. They go to, towards companies. Um, and um, that's important to know for white collar. I mean, maybe, I mean you've done white collar uh, criminal thing. If you go to prosecute Enron or whoever it is, and you say, we want this data, the IT lead for Enron will produce the data or face contempt of court problems. And so a very big fraction of devices and investigations are towards enterprises. 
And I think the likelihood that you can get that enterprise to comply with the law is extremely high. Do you have a different view on that for enterprises, Andrew? No, but I don't think that's, I mean, I don't think this is going to be a particular issue for prosecuting Enron. I mean, I think that the kinds of examples that I think are animating the discussion have to do with, on the law enforcement side, things like kidnapping. Um, and on the terrorism side have to do with the things that really keep good people up at night worrying about. Um, and I don't think you're going to have an issue of um, there's no corporate Fifth Amendment privilege for the Taliban. But it's, it's worth noticing, and I think this hasn't been enough in the discussion, that a great big amount of searches and seizures happen by going to organizations. And we have little reason to think that's a problem here. So we can always focus on what the problem is, but part of the going dark thing is that you still get all of the other enterprise things. An another thing that we saw in the crypto debates in the 90s is that if we say in the United States you can't do it or Apple won't do it, then the sophisticated criminals, the one we're worried about, get their own software and hardware solutions in some other way. In those days it was going to be Israel or some other country that would write the crypto. In this era, it might be an encryption app that you download from some other country that will turn out to encrypt the stuff on your phone. And so the sophisticated people will have those kinds of resources. The less sophisticated people will make various mistakes. And I think that combination is part of why we've seen so few instances that law enforcement can point to, despite this debate going on for years, where the frustration by crypto has really happened. Yeah, there was actually a news report just the last couple of days about ISIS using encryption apps and other forms of en encryption tools. Not, not uh, they weren't relying on Apple. Uh, but isn't that isn't the argument from that that um, if you can, um, you, you, there's no hundred percent solution, but if you can relegate um, the people you're most worried about to the, to a more limited sphere. Um, you, you have a better way to target your law enforcement and intelligence community resources. I mean, you can't do everything through informants. You need to have um, the ability to intercept as well. Being able to target what you think are going to be the most um, likely locations for um, those uh, activities that you're most worried about, it seems like a very good use of um, of resources as opposed to now they can use any communication, um, meaning Google, Apple, name your resource, because there, there's, um, there's a finite number of resources. There are thousands of leads that you have to cover, um, and Americans expect that, which is that if you have a lead that, it, that is potentially, let's take the worst case scenario on terrorism lead, that that is something that's going to be covered. Being able to narrow that to a certain group is going to be extremely useful in order to accomplish that. So I want to pick up on something, Andrew, just that you just said and yep. pose this to Peter. Um, so is there a tipping point, a uh, point at which encryption is so, is so ubiquitous and uh, providers stop holding the key and it's, there's end-to-end -end encryption, cri encryption at rest and in transit um, that the balance starts tipping very noticeably toward law enforcement, and, and th this debate becomes very different. We're, we're so far away from having super effective cybersecurity for everyone that I think we can, we can relax on that one for quite some time. That, that's, that's one answer. That goes to your overall assessment of things. Um, encryption has become prevalent in many ways that were opposed by law enforcement and national security in the 90s. Your hardware chips have encryption multiple times inside the chip to do all sorts of authentication and signing and other things. And we know when you're going across the insecure internet with the Wi-Fi hotspots and all the nodes that you don't know who they are, if you're not encrypted in transit, you're leaving your stuff wide open. So the shift to HTTPS, to having encryption between me and my email server, is brain dead obvious security. And I think having millions and millions of devices is very clearly obvious security as well. So uh, you, we could, and then you're, you're, but that doesn't answer the end point. Maybe we, maybe the crypto warriors get everything they want. And we have content wrapped up with encryption. And then people become super sophisticated using 
metadata screening using Tor and things we've never come close to imagining so you can't figure out the metadata. At that point, would there be reasons for government to fight back? Um, we, we are so far away from a world where the data is locked up like that. You know, with the commercial databases, with the government ability to get to the cloud, that it would take about 1,500 of possible things before breakfast to really get there. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about that. I think there's a converse to that, which is sort of to me, which is, is there, are there things that, that um, law enforcement and the intelligence community would say, you know what, you don't have to go that far. Um, in other words, what are the limits on both sides? And um, this is an area where it gets incredibly complicated very quickly. Um, but I think the answer to that, um, and again, speaking for myself, but ultimately it'll be, um, you know, for the, for the administration to, to have a position on this. But there, there are lots of issues that I think um, could be grounds for compromise. So for instance, one of the key arguments is that is this going to stifle innovation? And so having an exception for startups, whether it's based on, you know, dollar amount, time, uh, number of participants would be one way to have a carve out um, that, that those, those kind of companies wouldn't be covered. Um, you could have a Wi-Fi hotspot um, exception. Um, you could have private network exceptions. So you know, if a university is running something or companies are, are running something for just internal purposes. So there are lots of ways to um, try and um, have something which is an absolute. And I think there, the argument for that is that this is not a, there's no 100% solution. I mean, I just, I, unless you're an absolutist on either side, there are going to be trade-offs. And so, you know, it's not that you sit there and say, oh, this is great and there's no downside to it. It's a question of, are you, you know, in, in a world of no good solutions, are there areas where you can compromise, um, where you're not um, really sacrificing safety and security? I, well, one, one area we haven't talked on and a reason to be cautious about compromise. So I've made the arguments there's privacy and civil liberties reasons to be cautious. That there's security reasons to be cautious because of cybersecurity. There's also economic competitiveness reasons to be cautious. And so let's imagine a regime in which the United States is regulating down on encryption so that we don't have as effective encryption in the products. We have seen post-Snowden, and there's studies that show it in the tens of billions of dollars, enormous hits to U.S. economic actors. Uh, what European government in their procurement wants to buy from the U.S. if they think that's going to the NSA? And, and so part of the review group's message was uh, surveillance, the Internet is not there for surveillance. We don't want to build the entire Internet just so the NSA and the FBI have the best approaches. That when you're making decisions on surveillance, you should have the economic agencies involved. And it's been reported in the press, for instance, that the Commerce Department has consistently opposed CALEA II out of a view that it's a real harm to American commerce and economic competitiveness if we do. If we require holes in American products, it creates room for the competitors overseas to fill that hole and to gain market share and to take a lot of the first mover advantages we have and lose those. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, it's unfortunate that Apple made a bad messaging when they released this thing. If I had been their advisor, I would not have led off with the fact that we can frustrate legitimate law enforcement investigations. I don't think that's the way to lead off. But when you look at the facts, which is what we're looking at, having the effective encryption is part of the way American companies show to the world that you can trust our products. We'd sure rather have that than have the rest of the world say they're not going to use U.S. technology anymore. So the one piece of that I just wanted to focus on was, is the privacy and civil liberties concern, which I think is, is a, certainly a, val a valid concern. But the reason I don't think that it really comes um, sort of theoretically into play here is that suppose you had a system where the courts were saying, you know what, before we issue a warrant um, and allow electronic intercept, um, we are going to require proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, in other words, it is the highest gold standard you could think of. Um, that, I mean, would any of us say, okay, well, wait a second, there's still a privacy and civil liberties concern. I mean, that would be um, so much higher than what's currently um, required. Um, and even that, though, is not going to be possible in a world where you have full end-to-end -end encryption. It doesn't matter what you, what, whether you've shown it to a fairly well. You know, where there's not even, um, you know, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. 
Um, there's no doubt um, that you're still not going to get it. So the issue of sort of what the legal standard is and how much you're protecting civil liberties and privacy seems to me to not be an issue here. Um, it would just be a separate debate about, you know, should um, the government have a different showing that's required under Title III. But that debate, I think most people are satisfied that the normal debate for when you have to have electronic surveillance um, is, is a good standard and is fine. So I don't view this as a principally a sort of civil liberties issue um, uh, because of that. But it is a technology mandate to say that instead of having shades on your windows or locks on your doors or your safe or whatever, we're now going to say as a technology mandate that when you manufacture these things, you have to manufacture holes in them. That's definitely true. I mean, they're, they're, the government regulates in all sorts of ways. And usually, a lot of the people on the side of um, you know, sort of the you know, Apple Google side are usually the ones who are, are not um, really worried about um, government regulation. We have health like regulation, we <laughs> have environmental regulation, we have money laundering regulation. Um, Net neutrality is, is regulation. I mean, there, there are numerous ways in which the government regulates. Um, it's not regulation per se that's the issue. Um, money laundering costs companies to have an anti-money laundering system. It costs companies you know, millions and millions of dollars. But that's completely accepted as a way to ha not have companies participating um, either intentionally or unintentionally in money laundering operations. Before we go to questions, just one quick note. Um, there was one of the readings in the bibliography um, is from a, a professor of cybersecurity, uh, an engineer at Georgia Tech, Annie Anton, who I think is a fabulous uh, writer. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things she says is, at a time when we're messaging cybersecurity and trying to teach to all our students and our grad students and all the people in companies, the absolute essentialness, if that's a word, of locking down our systems and being secure, to have a message come from the highest levels of don't be too secure, that, that is going to blow Spock's mind. That really is just not, the, it's not easy to explain that to the engineers who are trying in a difficult world to handle the complexity and build good cybersecurity. Um, that, that's awfully hard to do, and it's a real bad message to come from the government. All right, so we are going to open it up to the audience. Uh, and uh, Nancy is also available to comment uh, in response to audience questions at this point. So um, this gentleman over here. Uh. <laughs> Both gentlemen. Oh, we're not going to let Chris, Chris have the mic. Um, I'm JC, and I have a question about citizens. If citizens have the ability to shred documents, burn devices, or whisper in the presence of microphones, why can't they have encryption? So there's no question that individuals um, can talk in code. Um, <coughs> they can shred documents. But that, in terms of the spectrum, that's because um, there's a big difference in terms of the effect on law enforcement and intelligence community between one person or several people doing something. Um, particularly um, in a way if they, if they just ha can do it on their own um, in terms of its effect on um, the ability to um, prevent you know, some law enforcement or, or um, national security event. There's, that's a huge difference from a company saying we are going to market on a general basis for everyone the ability to do something. So well, just remember, if you shred something, there, shredding itself can be illegal. Um, there, it depends on the circumstances of it. Uh, Mr. Weissman, my name is Chris Segoyan. I work for the ACLU. So um, when you described the main two ways that the government could still get information encrypted on a device, you described going to a cloud provider for backups, and you described uh, going to the individual and compelling them to disclose the information. Uh, the elephant in the room, of course, is there's a major third way, which is hacking into the device. Uh, the FBI has had a dedicated team of agents who do nothing but hack into people's devices, whether they're computers or mobile devices. They've had this team since 2001. Currently, it's called the Remote Operations Unit. You know this team exists because ultimately, you know, the buck stopped at your desk. 
The FBI has never gone to Congress. And, and I've read your pieces on Oh, fa fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, then you know what I'm going to say, right? So the FBI has never once gone to Congress to seek explicit legislation permitting the use of malware. And of the uh, court orders authorizing its use that have come to light, I've read every single one of them, I've never seen the FBI tell a judge, we are going to be hacking into this person's computer. They say, we have software that will reveal this. We wish, wish to insert the software into a web page. You, on stage, you talked about the important role of Congress and the important role of Article III judges, yet when it comes to hacking, which has been used for 15 years, law enforcement have never once gone to Congress publicly, they haven't been forthright with the courts, and on stage here, you're not even acknowledging that this capability exists. So isn't it a bit disingenuous to not talk about hacking in, the same, in this conversation when you cannot separate hacking and encryption? So. Um, the issue of, I mean, I think Apple actually addressed this, which is, is there a way to hack into their phones? Um, so just to keep it on, on this subject. Um, and according to them, it was going to take five years to that do was, that. that was so, that was right. So look, it, tech, in terms of technology, if it, as we said, if there is a way that what Apple and Google and other companies are doing is actually solvable with a court order that you can actually, with a court order, get into it. In other words, what Apple is saying is actually not true, um, that it is something that with a court order you can get it, then I would agree with you. Um, the issue is that that is not the world that I think is, is the one that we would live in um, and it is what I understand Apple and Google are going to do. Um, so I, I guess we have a fundamental disagreement. In terms of, I'm, I'm no longer the FBI general counsel. I can tell you that my understanding, having seen court orders, is that um, the FBI is upfront with courts about what it's doing. Can I just respond on that? Or, so a version of what Chris said, and Chris's article on privacy in the cloud is one of the places to read that really goes into how the data, in fact, is handled uh, in a lot of these backup situations. Um, but one way to uh, one thing that Chris's uh, question raises is the issue of zero day attacks, which is when there's a vulnerability that hasn't been used previously, and the FBI or an intelligence agency or somebody has a way in. And so, in the review group, there's it's been another source of controversy how much the U.S. government should stockpile these zero days and in what instances. And our um, our recommendation was to lean towards defense that. Tightening up cybersecurity in a wide range of places is the right way to go when it comes to these zero days. There's an article in Wired today that includes a long uh, interview with Mitch Daniels, cybersecurity lead at the White House, that goes into a lot of detail on this issue. Um, if we think the right way to go is to have lots and lots of zero days for the FBI, that would be counter to the sorts of approaches we were saying in the review group. Hello. OK, I know, I was a little confused. Hi, I'm Jacqueline, and I'm from nowhere in particular, <laughs> actually. Um, so from what I could hear of the debate, it seemed like there's a strong emphasis on more of like a consequentialist approach, um, kind of like a cost-benefit analysis to how this is all working out. Um, and even going apart from some of my issues with that, um, both, um, both of you mentioned the difficulty like in regards to risks and international policy, um, kind of at both ends. Um, so I guess my question would be, how do we ensure international, um, international norms and coordination? You know, whether, we, whether we're talking about building the back door or whether we're talking about the need to not build a back door. And if it is actually impossible to ensure that coordination, would that change your cost benefit um, to the point where the cost or the risk of public perception then um, outweighs the potential benefits. Did you want to take a try? I don't know. We, we haven't given you. Um, well, consequentialist is usually opposed to a sort of human rights approach. That would be the sort of other side. And in debates about encryption and debates about government surveillance, there's lots and lots written about human rights. There's a lot of discussion in Europe, for instance, about fundamental human rights and why privacy is invaded. Uh, that hasn't stopped the European intelligence agencies, perhaps, sometimes from doing the same things. But there's, there's stuff in the law there. Um, in terms of international norms, 
Uh, Richard Clark and others have written about the importance for cybersecurity of building up international norms uh, the way we did with uh, nuclear uh, treaties over time, leading to some successful reductions there in tension. Uh, and so confidence building measures step by step with some of the other major players such as China are good ideas. Uh, uh, and I think we should uh, try to find ways to build that cooperation. There's international summits and stuff where that happens. We shouldn't expect a huge progress in the short run. Um, but I think over a period of years, and I think the debates with China and the US on these issues is part of that, um, that's clearly part of what the US diplomatic agenda should be. It's simply not going to be the case in the, in the next three or five years. Um, the Budapest Convention on uh, Cybercrime uh, Convention was one step towards making cybercrime enforcement um, uh, uh, workable. Uh, but uh, any expansion of that has been really fiercely resisted, um, and it also has other problems on the civil liberty side to begin with. So it would be great to find a detente in this area, but we're, we're quite a ways away from it, I think. I, th I guess this is, the, uh, this is the aren't you being a bit disingenuous row. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my name is Dan Frumkin. I'm with The Intercept. I'm just wondering, uh, you know, you, you talk about how we shouldn't be absolutists. You talk about how we should, you know, find some middle ground. Is there a middle ground here? I mean, can you have little teeny tiny back doors? I mean, isn't, it, isn't this a, a, a zero or one question? And by saying, well, let's split the difference, you're, you're being disingenuous. Well, I just, I don't, like I said, I don't see that. I mean, th there's, there are all sorts of ways. That, I mean, it, so for instance, you know, the most expansive view you could have is, oh, Kalia should be expanded to cover uh, emails and chat, and it should apply, you know, to any any provider, whether they're public or private. In other words, you could have a, a very very expansive view, um, but there's a lot of steps short of that um, that you could do. So I, I just I guess I don't view it as something where um, there aren't intermediate steps. Yes, if you have a view which is that any, if you start with the proposition that anything that is regulation is bad, then if the, that that's just un unacceptable, then you, that, yes, then it would be a zero or one because you know, you've opened the door to it. But I think there, you know, in the same way that Kalia was not an all or nothing, it was, it was as many th bills are, it's, it was a compromise. I, I want to spin off of that and pose a question to both of you. Um, is this is this on? Uh, pose a question to both of you um, and push Peter a little on a question that he got earlier. Um, one can imagine a world where there is no strong encryption without some notional golden key that only the authorities, whoever the authorities are, can use. Golden key being the language used in a Washington Post editorial criticizing Apple and Google. Yeah. One can also imagine um, a world where everything is encrypted uh, everything in transit, everything at rest, only I have the keys to my data, uh, even the data that's backed up. Andrew, I'm wondering if you think that a world where there is no strong encryption but with a backdoor for the authorities, with whatever legal authority, uh, a legal process is necessary, uh, is that a good world? And Peter, I ask the same of you, like even if it would take 15,000 things before breakfast, is that a good world or is that a scary world? So. I don't know if you want to take a crack at one of these. Yeah, We're feeling guilty that you sure. haven't uh, spoken um, more yet. So I'll take yeah. a crack at that. I mean, I come at this, um, you know, like everyone, I, it's based on my experience, which has been in law enforcement and intelligence community. Um, we uh, have been in an, a world under Kalia where there is that ability where to get an intercept. And having seen the advantages of it, I really say thank goodness. I live in New York. I am aware that it is a target not only of, of sort of routine law enforcement criminal matters, but of, in, of national security. Uh, it's a national security target. And um, electronic intercepts are absolutely critical. I think that's something that the intelligence community here and overseas would say is really necessary. Um, I totally believe in getting things through a court order, in being upfront with the court, in meeting the legal standard. 
um, and being held to task um, if law enforcement doesn't. Um, but I think that's a better world. I, I mean, to be very simplistic about it, um, if I have to choose, um, I am more concerned about um, sort of catastrophic issues than I am about um, being hacked. And I don't mean to say that because I'm belittling the hacking problem. It's just that life is full of very, very difficult choices. And so I will be the first to admit that I don't have the perfect line. I have a lot of information that I would need to know exactly where that line should be, where I think the costs and benefits are, are no longer require um, uh, there to be an intercept solution. But in the sort of like, what world would I want to live in? It would be in a world where I know that with the requisite court order, um, law enforcement and the intelligence community can um, actually know what bad things are going on. I want to compliment Kevin on an exquisitely balanced question that shows, you know, both sides can go too far was sort of the text of the question. Um, but I think that's a misplaced equivalence, and I think it's because of technology. So, so let me try to uh, uh, back that up. Um, the idea of a world where only I have my keys, that would mean, by the way, that the grandmother and the eight-year-old only have their keys. That's bad key management. <laughs> Don't do it. Uh, in fact, it's extremely risky and difficult for individuals to manage their keys so that nobody else in the world touches it. Because if you screw up your backup or you forget your passphrase, you know, then your phone's turned into a brick. So key management is very hard in encryption. Beyond that, um, having spent time on encryption both before and after the review group, implementation of encryption systems is far more difficult than it is, uh, than is, is often understood. So the story that I heard from my tech friends was the crypto systems, the algorithms, we have a certain level of uh, confidence that they're hard to break. A lot of really smart people have tried for a long time and they haven't been able to break it. As you actually build each system, which is complicated, in many, many instances, Bruce Schneier and others people will say, there are ways to break the implementation. And that can be done with court orders, it can be done with zero days, it can be done with the enterprise's permission. There's an awful lot of ways that happens. And so the fact that grandma can't control her key and that nobody builds implementation very well means we're not going to get to that hyper-encrypted world anytime soon. We should be getting a whole lot closer to it because we have cybersecurity holes everywhere, but we're not in danger of suddenly grandma and everybody else being perfect at encryption. Any other questions? If not, I have a <laughs> um, so both the FBI director and the attorney general have noted the possible need for congressional action on this issue. Uh, I'm curious what folks uh, think might happen if this actually, if any legislation comes forward. Um, you know, a few notable data points. There is an ongoing fight over NSA and surveillance, which is to some extent perhaps coming to a head tomorrow with a cloture vote in the Senate on USA Freedom. Um, there was also this amendment that passed as part of the appropriations bill in the House, the Massey Lofgren Amendment, that actually would have forbid the intelligence community from using funds to uh, request or require companies to build back doors into their products and services. And um, so I'm curious, reading the tea leaves, what do you think, what do you think the prospects for this kind of legislation would be in the next Congress? What do you think the battle lines would look like? Um, Etc. I wonder if Nancy, as the Washington lawyer out of the three of us, might take a shot at that. Sure, happy to. I, yes. I would not be optimistic about, and putting aside uh, just the inability of Congress of late to get much done, uh, I mean, I just think the politics of this just cut across party lines in such a way that I think you'd have people on both sides lining up um, opposing uh, legislation to uh, require backdoors. I think you'd even have um, you know, I think some of the folks, Mike Lee and Rand Paul and those, uh, the usual suspects would form a, a coalition. Um, and I think that's a harder um, thing. I think the technology companies would lobby that incredibly, uh, be very, very strong in lobbying against that. I just don't see that moving forward. Particularly when I think, um, I think if there were 
examples that were did illustrate the the real problem and I think that has been one of the challenges is is really showing that law enforcement doesn't have other ways in which it can get this information and whether this is just a case of making law enforcement's job a little bit less difficult and I don't mean to yeah. minimize how difficult law enforcement's job is or whether this really is truly a crisis for law enforcement and I think until that becomes clear I think it's a very hard thing to move So we have a few more minutes. Uh, I, Chris would like to ask another question of Andrew. So before we air, <laughs> before we air yet another fun, fundamental one. disagreement between <laughs> Andrew and Chris, um, uh, I, you know, I welcome questions to Peter, pushing him <laughs> on his arguments. I will throw one at you, Peter. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Frumkin here has done a great story, and the AP also did a good story, uh, taking down uh, Director Comey's examples of cases that would have been hindered if this encryption had been in place. And that those examples kind of fell apart. The cases looked like they could have prosecuted or gotten uh, uh, pleas in those cases regardless of encryption. What if that changed? What if a year or two from now, the FBI were to show up with a list of horrible crimes that they could not solve in specific instances, kidnapping, child porn, et cetera, et cetera. Um, would that change your perspective? How would that change your perspective? So the, the rhetorical answer back is right now we have no shown loss to law enforcement versus a ton of bad consequences. And that would shift to some harm to law enforcement versus a ton of harmful consequences. And we'd have to do the factual discussion. And I believe that I would be very firmly on the same side of having good security in our communication structure because we depend on that so much for our survival as a society and an economy that that's a huge and overriding concern. Um, so, so I, I think 5, 10, 50 cases would not change my view on that. It would make the discussion different in Congress, but I think that um, the, the Riley quote from Chief Justice Roberts in the existence of the Fourth Amendment is that sometimes law enforcement doesn't get what it wants. They don't get general warrants. The Fourth Amendment stopped that. Uh, Andrew in his, in his blog post uh, uh, on this topic talked about Boyd, which we didn't get into today a 19th century case where the government was stopped very hard in getting at our papers and effects. Um, the uh, Fourth Amendment reasons combined with the cybersecurity reasons would take an enormous showing of actual harm that we just haven't seen. And that's despite the crypto wars in the 90s and 15 years to build up examples since then. I, I do commend, oh, Nancy? Oh, no, no, no. I, I was going to just follow up on your question. Um, and. To both, uh, to both Andrew and Peter, I'm wondering if there are different harms or concerns associated with uh, law enforcement, uh, or d whether law enforcement has different concerns than the intelligence community, or whether there are similar concerns. And I know, Peter, just from your experience on the review group, you might have seen things that were unique to the intelligence community uh, with respect to encryption. Maybe that changed. And the it. FBI is an anti terrorist group that does intelligence also. Correct. So, I mean, the law enforcement community um, has, has different concerns, and certainly at the state and local level, um, and even some federal agencies where there wouldn't be necessarily um, the same kind of sharing that there would be on the intelligence side. So there are definitely distinct issues um, in terms of, I think, you'd have state and locals and certain sort of pure pure law enforcement agencies are, are, are very vocal on um, the going dark issue. Um, I tend to, in the, this issue of sort of, has law enforcement and the intelligence community done a good job of coming up with examples? And I think they need to do a better job. I mean, there's no question that they're, the, they're you never can, it's, it, it's not a scientific experiment. You're not gonna have a pure, um, case where you can just say, but for X, we would not know why, and there is no other possible alternative way, because no one can ever know that there is no other alternative way. But they definitely still could do a better job. Um, I do think that one, to give um, people who are not within law enforcement and in the intelligence community some insight into this, I think if you look at the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board report and compare 
their analysis of the 215 program to their analysis of the 702 program. Um, I think that gives you some sense of sort of where I'm coming from when I talk about there's a big difference between metadata um, and knowing the content of communications. So 215 is metadata, seven, um, 702 is content of communications. And um, I'm a huge fan of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Um, I think they're really serious and asked, asked really good questions. I mean, uh, you know, you don't have to agree with everything they come up with and um, you can still think that they're doing a really admirable job for the country and for law enforcement and for the intelligence community in asking those questions. But if you look at what they said about um, the 702 program, there wasn't a question that that type of data, um, being able to intercept those kinds of calls was absolutely critical to the intelligence community um, in keeping the country safe. Um, and I think that gives you some insight into what it is that when you hear from people in the intelligence community that it's not just um, people sort of overhyping, um, that you do have some external body that has looked at this and understands that there is a real value um, to that type of electronic surveillance. Just a, a way to tell that history is slightly different is 215, the telephone calls of Americans to Americans, was a bulk collection program, government holding millions of phone records about millions of Americans. 702 is specific targeting when you have a reason to go after a particular target, somebody who's overseas um, communicating perhaps with someone back home. Um, and so instead of it being data versus metadata, I think it comes back to one of the big themes in the debate in Senate this week which is a, a, a special caution around bulk collection that then is used in ways that are hard to know and control, and much more favoritism towards specific traditional collection and investigations, which is but, what 702 offers. But that can, be, that can be totally, one can accept that, but in terms of this discussion, if you have an, true end-to-end -end encryption and know where to get at it, it's going to eradicate um, even the targeted um, approach that you say is can be useful. So I mentioned all of your thoughts on this. Um, it, to pull it out a little bit more of a technical side, um, the, this this discussion of having every company who develops hardware and software built in a backdoor seems just crude and inelegant <laughs> a solution, um, and it also sort of seems, uh, I know, given the global nature of uh, development, the state of cryptography, cryptography even in the open source, um, the richness of tools and people that develop apps and all, um, and software and hardware, um, doesn't seem that likely to work. Is is it, um, it, it so if, if you get the door open on an iPhone, you know, there's right now in this country, Silent Circle, um, and other t kinds of programs like that. So I guess, um, is the intent to really just drive people away from mainstream stuff to more, you know, stuff that's developed overseas um, and it's easier to track the fewer number of people to do, to do that. Is that sort of the law enforcement intent or is this sort of just doing what we can on the law enforcement side? And I don't mean that in a normal right. way. I, just no, no, no. I, I don't think it w I would say it's their intent. Um, I would say that it may be a, a byproduct that's something that you have to deal with. But the ability to, if, if you, the inevitable byproduct is that you will have a certain percentage of people who go to um, certain uh, to other types of providers, at least that f can focus your resources. Um, it is a lot easier than if you end up saying, okay, well, you know, we haven't focused it, and now I want to take our resources, and you have to figure out everybody on Apple, everybody on Google. Um, and so, it, again, it's not ideal. I agree with you that there is a problem posed by that, but it becomes a more manageable program, a uh, problem to deal with. My question relates to the, um, the, the notion that there has, you know, we have basically Article Three court protections with respect to the uh, use of the um, surveillance mechanism. Would 
um, if you were to insist upon a back door in technology, would you also insist that um, Apple, say, and Google would be proscribed from sharing its back door with foreign countries that do not provide those same Article Three like protections? So I think that's the, I think a really hard issue if I was internal to a company is how to deal, which I think they have to do now regardless of this issue, is how to deal with regimes where you're concerned about their legal regime, their human rights regime. Um, I don't think that's unique to this issue. Um, in other words, I think there, you have this issue right now for those companies, um, and they have to deal with a very, very difficult legal and ethical issues. I don't think that this would measurably change that equation. Um, so that if you have created a system where you have done that, where you have created end-to-end -end encryption, that if you're in an oppressive regime, that that's going to be some kind of get out of jail free card. I, but I, I mean, I agree with you that there is a huge issue, um, and I'm too quote from Peter, I think that the one area of agreement is that there's a lot of work for the State Department. I mean, there's, there's how to deal with international cooperation in an area where you have a whole array of countries, some facing the ex with very similar interests, facing the same issues that we're facing, um, and others which don't, don't have the same legal and ethical um, prescriptions. I don't have a really good answer, though, to, to that, other than I think companies are facing it no matter what. So folks have sort of danced around this a little bit. I want to try and focus a little bit more uh, closely on this point. Many of the apps that people are using are made by companies. And so governments have the ability to coerce companies into doing things for them. We can argue about whether that's right or not. But many of the most popular encryption apps are actually made by nonprofit collectives of individuals. They're not even, uh, there, there aren't even 513Cs in many cases. These are just open source groups, individuals who get together, they write code, they compile code, they put it online and people download it in, in downloaded form um, or, or in binary form that they've made available. So I guess part one of the question is if many people, I mean millions of people are using open source encryption apps, what do governments do if the communications shift to groups who cannot be coerced. You're, you don't go to a single developer, and if you know half the developers are in Germany and half the developers in the United States, you know what, what do you do there? And, and a second piece of that question is, if some of the apps are in the United States and some of the apps are from foreign companies, it seems that the logical conclusion is not to require backdoors in the apps or weakened encryption in the apps, but rather to require backdoors in the operating systems. And the two most widely made operating systems in the world are by Google and Apple, who coincidentally are the companies who are being uh, pointed out and uncalled out by the FBI. And so I guess, Andrew, even though you're no longer working there, to the extent that you're now thinking about this a bit more publicly, do you think that there should be law enforcement backdoors and interfaces not in the communication services offered by these companies, but in the operating system so that regardless of which communications app people are using, governments can get into the operating system. So let me just take issue with one thing um, before I answer your question, which is I think um, I don't know that um, the Department of Justice is calling out Google um, as opposed to, let me just finish. Um, I think the thing that sparked or, or reignited the going dark um, debate, I think, was um, the Apple announcement and particularly the way it was phrased um, because this issue had largely been dormant post Snowden, um, I think probably for just very practical political <laughs> reasons. Um, and, you know, I think that if you phrase something as being done because you want to thwart law enforcement, I think, I mean, that's something that for an American company taking advantage of US laws seems striking, as opposed to saying it's a byproduct of some other good, um, and which, I, which is traditionally how it's been um, thought of. So I think that was sort of what got focused on. Um, I do think that 
in the nature of um, Silicon Valley that there's a certain amount that ev everyone needs to be at the same level because there need needs to not be market differentiation on these issues. So I think people quickly sort of fall in line. Um, so I don't think there's any effort to um, single out anyone as opposed to there was a company, because of the way they phrased it, that sort of raised this issue anew. Um, I don't know the answer um, to that. I think that's going to be, to me, that is, um, again, a difficult issue. I think that there are, I don't, my sense is that there isn't a lot of appetite for um, trying to have apps covered by Kalia. Um, that's, that's my own um, two cents. I think it, that comes at a cost, um, but I think that's, I think there was a gentleman before who asked the question of like, isn't this all or nothing? And I think the answer is it isn't all or nothing. There are lots of issues about how to do something. Um, and I don't know the answer to, to your question um, about whether that would be worth it, um, whether having that kind of regulation would be worth the cost. So we're a little over time now, but I did want to give the uh, uh, debaters an opportunity to uh, give one last comment, one or two minutes, if they like. I, I do, do you want to go? go? Okay. Oh, is is oh. there one more question? Well. I can tell. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Should I go? go ahead? Okay. So I have uh, three items, each of which is short. Um, the first is that uh, this debate happens as surveillance reform legislation is going through Congress. And it's at least possible to think that part of the reason to bring back fears of going dark is to take momentum out of the chances for reform. Those chances of reform come fairly rarely, and I hope that we'll move forward in Congress this year to get the USA Freedom Act passed. Um, but the, by raising the specters of the loss of law enforcement activities, so I think that's a problem. Second thing is I commend to you the Internet Architecture Board announcement just this week about the importance of building encryption into protocols and other parts throughout the internet. And it's consistent with the extremely widespread technologist view of this matter about the importance of having effective cybersecurity as we build these communications structures. And the third thing, and this does not apply to the FBI today or when Andrew was general counsel, but applies to the FBI of years gone by, there's been a release of new details about uh, the letter that was sent to Martin Luther King during the 1960s that was basically a blackmail note sent by FBI Director Hoover uh, urging King not to go uh, accept his Nobel Prize. The history of surveillance is in part a history of potential abuses of power and sometimes actual abuses of power. And so we try to create structures that in the long run will let democracy flourish and an economy flourish. Um, and when that happens, we're going to have many strong powers for law enforcement and national security. But we also have to keep building in each generation a set of safeguards against overuse of those powers. Thank you, Peter. Andrew? Um, so in terms of government abuses, um, so uh, there's no question that it is healthy. Um, whether I was in government or now I'm not in government, um, for people to be skeptical of what government says and to say, prove it. Um, we need to see it. It it's, can be difficult in the going dark area because there's some part of the discussion that can't be public. Um, if you tell um, really serious criminals exactly what you actually can and cannot monitor, obviously it gives them a roadmap. Um, but there, there is no question that it's, it's totally fair to be skeptical and to demand more information. It's also right to worry about all sorts of things, whether it's Martin Luther King um, or Watergate or um, the church committee, to worry about instances of the government having abused its power. Um, and that, though, is not to say, OK, because I know that, so we're just going to throw, we're not going to actually deal with an issue. Um, the issue there is, what are the safeguards? Is it, is it necessary? And what safeguards are there for the government in terms of um, what it's doing? In this issue, we're dealing with a question of the government acting pursuant to a court order. Um, and actually, just with the question of whether that court order can be effectuated. 
So I don't view the, that specter as being something that's particularly relevant to this issue. So I don't think it really helps inform the debate. To me, it is, there's, I think, Peter's comment that our um, means of communication have really grown, that there are certain types of data that the government can get through lawful process that it couldn't get in 1994 is true. But by the same token, all of that um, metastasizing of uh, modalities are also ways in which criminals um, can operate. And the issue is, can law enforcement have the same kinds of tools that it had in 1994 in order to, with a court order, track what it is that criminals are doing, whether it be ordinary law enforcement targets or intelligence community targets? Any closing thoughts, Nancy? I think this was, I think uh, <coughs> Andrew and uh, Peter did a, a wonderful job of showing both sides of, uh, of the debate. I don't think it's going to be concluded anytime soon, but. Well, I hope you'll all join me in, in thanking our panelists, and I look forward to having this debate again in 2030. Thank you.